Uh, I will hand this over to Ms. Pollack. Uh, the item on our agenda is the Main Street Master Plan update. Okay, thank you. We have our consultants AMT here for the 65% update. And I'm going to turn it over to our project engineer, Paul Mauser, to give you a brief update on what you're going to hear today. Excellent. Okay, thank, thank you, Amanda. Again, my name is Paul Mauser. It is a, uh, a pleasure to uh, be here presenting the 65% submittal of the Main Street Master Plan to Council. Uh, we've gone a long way in this project. Uh, it's been very successful. Uh, we have uh, Kathy and Steve here from AMT. They are our design consultants for this project. Uh, again, uh, uh, we are reviewing the 65% submittal. Uh, we were just meeting uh, before this, so I apologize for being a little bit uh, late to this meeting. Uh, but we were reviewing uh, lots of utilities and lots of um, items that are underground. However, however, for this meeting, we want to present all of the visual treatments. Uh, I know the council would like to have say in um, how the uh, streetscape comes together and how uh, the, the visuals appear. So we'll be reviewing uh, street lights and uh, bike racks and um, uh, all you know, trash receptacles and uh, benches and, and items of that uh, uh, that nature. Um, we'll also provide um, a discussion on dedicated bike lanes. Uh, that has been a big subject recently. And we certainly want to uh, get some resolution there as far as uh, should we proceed or not proceed. And also I'd like to provide just a quick, um, a quick uh, concept discussion. I was presented by uh, our, um, I, I discussed with Brett Davis, um, uh, essentially a basement build out of a building that he owns on West Main Street. And if we can proceed with that or, or not. So. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Kathy and Steve at this point from AMT for a presentation. Steve is going to present to you, um, as Paul had mentioned, the hardscape and streetscape features. We had gone through some of the geometrics on the last meeting, and so we're progressing to 90% plans, and this is where these details will be worked out. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to walk everyone through the site plan quickly and just point out some of the color coding that we currently have on the plan. That will help everybody be, to be able to envision what's going on. And I was trying to actually zoom a little bit more so that we could really get in. And see the plan a little bit easier. So here we are on West Main and is what you're seeing in blue is actually where the permeable pavers are. They're color-coded in blue because they absorb water in a sense, so that was the rationale. But that's not the color that they will actually be on the streetscape. The colors that you see in this area, this is actually a raised table and crosswalk. And so the colors here you're looking at are pavers. And those pavers would match in either color and texture, or they would complement the permeable pavers that go through the site. These areas here in green that have this hatch on them, which is a honeycomb hatch, are bioretention. So they are actually capturing water off of the street, and they will be treating some of our stormwater from the streetscape. The tree symbol right here and then next to the tree symbol this little line right here indicates actually a street light as we move up there are other symbols this is a bench right here uh, this is a pay uh, meter right here for the streetscape these areas right here are outdoor eatery space opportunities and um, as you will see, there, we have some ideas about how to delineate those spaces, both from the streetscape a little bit, but also from the walking area. So I will pan through the site so that we can see a little bit of a chunk of it. You'll notice here at this intersection that we're proposing another raised table. And there are, you know what, I apologize, I'm going to go back. That's at St. Peter's. Yes, yeah, so thank Market you. Market Street and St. Peter's. This raised table right here is being done for a couple of reasons. One is a transition into 
the new streetscape. The other is, is that on the historic synagogue, which has its front door right here, there's no way to step off of their front step and be able to make this space ADA accessible for the sidewalk. And so the raised table actually raises the road up so that when people cross this crosswalk right here that we don't have conflicts with this front door. We did discuss sliding this crosswalk down the road. However, we felt concerned about people taking a right-hand turn and potentially hitting somebody <clears throat> because they weren't paying attention. This speed table here has a little bit of a different purpose and ultimately it's really to help calm traffic as they move through the space. And just so that I define a speed table, it is not a speed bump, the one that takes out the transmission of your own personal car, but it is a soft transition from the existing streetscape up to a flat platform and then another soft transition. Um, if you were doing 50 miles an hour, that first soft transition would probably give you a little bump, but it is not the traditional big box shopping kind of speed bump that people think of. Now we're coming up on Division Street, and I will point out something here. These dots here indicate uh, bollards that will actually be depressed down into the streetscape and can be pulled up. They happen on both the beginning and ending so that during whatever occasion that this portion of the streetscape can be closed off to vehicles and it will be a pedestrian way. The nice thing about these bollards is that they just drop right back into the street <coughs> and nobody will know that they're there and nobody has to find a hiding place for those bollards. We also have a few bollards that will occur that are more decorative at these locations so that um, cars as are going up and over the speed table, they will be at the same or close to the same grade as the curb and gutter so that they don't veer off into pedestrians. I'll come back to Division Street. I'll continue on Main Street. Once again, pointing out the the uh, microbioretention facilities, and some of them are green planters, but they will be planted and designed so that they appear as a uh, unit. This is the eatery that's in front of Mojo's here. And then we continue to the end of Main Street for this project with very similar uh, materials happening. I did not point out what the gray is here. The gray is, is concrete and uh, we will be scoring it in such a way that it is both aesthetically pleasing and functions. The crosswalks as I come back the crosswalks that we see here will be um, concrete, or they will be pavers on top of a concrete base, and uh, they will have concrete uh, bands on both sides to make sure that those pavers don't move as traffic goes up and over them. That's something that's a little bit different than the last time we were yeah. here to talk. We had talked about a variety of options, stamped asphalt, thermoplastic, but the more we've talked about it, the more we really feel like we need to set the standard of having actual pavers in downtown for the crosswalk. So I think that'll look very nice and having them set in concrete on a concrete bed and then, and then sand on top of those will keep them more stable so we're not as concerned about them settling because they're, they're on a concrete bed. And although we are replacing the utilities in this project, there was some concern, well, what happens in the future if somebody has to come through and rip up the streetscape? The nice thing about the pavers is the pavers can actually be pulled up, set aside, the utilities run through, they can put the new concrete down below it, and then the pavers would go on top. So it would be a seamless patch, as opposed to some of the other alternatives, you would end up with a mismatch. A mismatch. 
So as we move up towards Division Street, we have very similar treatments. One of the things that we were discuss discussing from our comments is actually that this band of pavers here would continue along the front of the curb and this microbioretention would actually go away and then the sidewalk would come out to this edge to give a uniform and clean look in front of the both historic building here and the, uh, the county building where we're currently at. These paver bands would, would create the core of this plaza space. We added street trees or plaza trees into the space to provide a little bit of shade. Um, it will get hot in here during the middle of the summer. This space is a small water feature and is intended to be not something that's spraying water 20 or 30 feet in the air, but to be very subtle where you're still getting a little bit of water splashing, but that it's called a skim pool. People would be able to walk into it. And then here we have a place for people to sit, to eat something. Um, some smaller con conversation can happen here in this location. Up here, we're calling this a little bit of the stage, and it depends on how you look at it, and it can function in several directions. One would be where the community or people can gather here and listen to somebody up here on top of the steps so that they can see them. The other option is to actually have a smaller gathering where you may have a small art event or something like that after hours where people would be able to uh, sit on the steps going up and the performance would actually happen down here similar to an amphitheater. So I am now going to bump over and start to describe some of the streetscape features. And I think I'm going to try to zoom in a little bit. Yeah. <clears throat> so here are... Um, there are obviously other opportunities uh, for selecting materials for the streetscape. This is a vignette that we felt tied the streetscape together that fit in character with downtown Salisbury and that would work not only for this year and next year but um, into the future. The benches would be a, be a bench that evokes back to the past a little bit uh, looking at use of uh, steel material that's powder coated so that it's very durable and will last a long period of time. The bike rack, as you can <coughs> see, mimics some of the form associated with some of the curves on the benches. And just so everyone knows, this is a planned view of the bench and then this is the section and, and for all the site furnishings we'll see that. It's worth noting that the benches are only four feet wide, which would <coughs> not be wide enough to allow someone to sleep in. And that was a concern of the SPD. That's correct. Yet they are still wide enough that two people can sit comfortably on them and still have enough space so that um, even if two strangers were sitting next to each other, they would not feel so close that they now have to get engaged. <laughs> so. We would space the bike racks throughout the site to make sure that there was ample uh, bike spaces to lock up. <clears throat> in a couple of loca locations, including in front of here in the plaza space, we would add additional bike parking spaces. And then at some of the restaurants, we would probably have instead of one, but two, so that there is sufficient room. The trash receptacles that we selected are both fun and, and uh, exciting. It's a location where the city would be able to potentially put on some, some graphics onto them and uh, can either promote something that the city wants to say to the public or can promote some green ideas such as recycling. Uh, that's uh, what we actually placed on it here which is to, to uh, 
to love, uh, what did we say? I have to even zoom in. It's been a few weeks since we plastered this on here. So, but just an opportunity to really look at recycling. So one would be trash, one would be recycling. The, uh, the interesting thing about these is they have a photovoltaic on top of them, and they actually trash compact. So they'll actually um, make it so that more trash can be placed in them. And Steve, we in fact adopted a, uh, a recycling campaign in the city, uh, and I think the county, and I should mention, we've got the county executive in the room, Mr. Culver, right, right now. Thank, welcome, Mr. Culver. Um, I, I think both entities adopted a, a recycling campaign, so... You know, that was what Ms. Mitchell trash. and I were just whispering about, the uh, stash your trash campaign. So that, that's a great idea. Yes. Sorry to interrupt your flow. Oh, no, <laughs> not a problem at all. Please feel free to ask any questions as we move through. These are the bollards that I said are more attractive and that they would be at the raised tables to ensure that uh, cars cannot veer off and um, run into the sidewalk. <clears throat> These are the bollards that would close off West Main Street. And uh, the bollards are beefy enough to be able to, to stop people. They have at the very top of them a reflective material so that they can be seen at night. They lock in the, in the up position and both in the down position. And um, they're not so beefy that they can't be pulled up by a, a typical person. There are other ones that are larger, but they usually require electricity to them to actually be able to actuate them to come up because they're so heavy. <clears throat> Here we're showing two options for the eateries. So I'm going to flash back quickly to my other image and we'll zoom in here. Can I ask you a question when you go for that one? Yes. Up? You mentioned the bioretention. And of course, I automatically go to standing water when I hear bioretention. I know that's not what you have in mind, but if you can give me some idea of what that would, or is that later? Get you know what? Idea? I can um, I can show some images, but I can talk about that a little bit. So the bioretention here will be underdrained. The reason that they're underdrained ultimately is because of the soil types that you have in the downtown area. They don't infiltrate. The idea and the function of that under drain is to make sure that the water is gone within 24 hours. The 24 hour period is based on a standard pretty much set across almost the entire nation. And when I say a standard, it's just that when we go into Philadelphia, into the District of Columbia, um, into um, the Pacific Northwest, that's the, that's the timeline that we're looking at. And really it's focused on how long it takes a mosquito to hatch its eggs and lay its eggs. So that's the 24 hour period drawdown time. Mm. And the under drain will help us to achieve that goal. The idea is to <clears throat> slow down the water so that, as it in, in, so that as it goes into the microbioretention facility that it can hang out there for that 24 hour period of time or less. And then it would draw down through the under drain and then go into the normal um, storm drain system. Okay. So, no standing water. Thank you. That's exactly what huh. I'm worried about, mosquitoes. So, if I do a cut through this area, this is the basically what segregates um, the outdoor cafe place or plaza space into the rest of the streetscape, both where pedestrians are able to walk here and where cars are driving down the street. And so we looked at this as an opportunity to really green the streetscape. Um, everybody is familiar with Mojo's and they do have a, a beautiful space that they have created. But we wanted to take it one step further and look at this space as an opportunity to um, create a little bit more green even create a space where people or the restaurant, when I say people, I mean the restaurant, may be able to grow herbs or something like that out on their streetscape plaza. And it helps to create a nice buffer between the rest of the streetscape and the outdoor eating space. So these were two options that we looked at and um, we like both of them as, as alternatives. And I think it's an interesting discussion to say, well, who takes care of them? Yeah. And um, 
because they did have to have, they had some of the big planters out there and they asked for them to be removed because they were an eyesore. They were an eyesore. So the opportunity to go to something like what Mojo's has now is, is definitely there and something that we can present those alternatives. And, and I would say of the two, when you look at the, the planner shown to the right, the one that says Victor Stanley, I believe, underneath of it, um, there is the element itself, um, I think, could potentially be more of a, um, a, a visual uh, benefit to the streetscape, um, whether or not there was a lot of greenery hanging over. So if there wasn't, it would still be attractive. Whereas the element on the <laughs> left the, with the, the metal pieces, it looks like, you know, I think if if you had dried or dead plant matter, it would look much yes. less attractive. So just something to think about in terms of maintenance, um, that the element on the right could be standalone, well, uh, nice, attractive bear. Yeah, and the mix that you put in it so that there's something there in the winter. It's not mm -hmm. just dead weeds. Right. You know, or dead plants in the winter. Um, Agreed. Kind of intermingles with it. But um, the other concern that they had, I'll share, they had a bench right outside of that area, and we ended up removing that as well because... It turned out to be a place for a lot of um, our panhandlers and things like that to sit right outside their door and uh, talk with their customers. Yes. <laughs> yes. We'll be diplomatic here. <clears throat> uh, and that, was, that became a real problem for them. So if, when we're thinking about pl where those are, just keep that in mind. That's, that's a very good comment. One of the things that we also discussed about making the planters so that they were vibrant and attractive during the summer months is to add drip irrigation to them as part of the overall system that is currently being put in. That would ensure that there is water at these locations and that uh, it would not require that the restaurant owners actually have to water them. So that would be one added value. I think that there is opportunity as part of the agreement that occurs between the restaurant owner and the city to be able to require that they actually maintain them if this is the direction we decide to go. Okay. So now we're getting into lighting and uh, one light is a little too tall I can see, but not for real. <laughs> So the smaller light that you see here would be in front of the courthouse and it evokes kind of that historic pedestrian experience. So let me just flip back to that quickly so that everyone can understand. Those lights are these lights here and they would be concentrated in this space here. The light next to, you, to it is the light that we are proposing for the downtown streetscape. There's opportunities on this light to be able to include banners. And as we go through the design, we would design it so that the banner stands are part of the light pole. So that as soon as the city is ready for whatever event or whatever they want to have as part of the theme for the downtown streetscape that they could be put up. The, um, the extra banner on the side may or may not be here. It really depends on how we want to highlight public uh, parking opportunities. <coughs> and when I say public parking opportunities, I don't mean the public parking that's on Main Street. I mean making sure that people garage. understand where the garage, garage is at and things like that. And I like that. <laughs> so. I have a question. Yes. Like, I, um, I love the lights in Princess Anne, Maryland. I don't know if you've ever been to Princess Anne, any of you, the lights. I don't know no, if they not have, recent. they're not recent, but they have beautiful lights at night. They really line the street downtown Princess Anne. They did a street scape mm -hmm. years ago. We can look at those. Look at those. I don't know if they had the banner idea, but I like the banner idea too. And what would be the cost of those big tall with the banner? Oh, this price right here, is running about five to six thousand dollars a piece installed. Times yeah. one hundred lights. Well, it's all part of the uh, budget. Yeah. Is it really? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, all of, all of this is the original yeah. budget. Yeah. 
But check out the lights down because they're beautiful. I just, you know, this old town. Yes. Downtown, and it's really, I just love the lights down there. By the way, there's a cigarette butt grant out there right now. I don't know if any of you saw that. I, did I send that to you? Um, while we're doing this, there may be some opportunity to tag onto that for some receptacles for the cigarette butts or some cleanup uh, facet for that, those. That's a great idea. All of these lights would be LED, LED. lights. Mm -hmm. All of the lights would have a way to plug into them towards the top of it so that the city during certain activities or certain events would be able to stream lights down the pole. And, uh, and so that's something that can be easily done. One of the benefits of doing it that way is that it ensures that your lights are, your, your beautiful twinkling lights for whatever event are always twinkling and that people don't unplug it so that they can charge their cell phone. <laughs> So. Not that that would ever happen. <laughs> <laughs> when, your when your cell phone needs to be charged, you don't care what you unplug. It just is the way it happens. We move on towards the rest of the wayfinding for the streetscape. These larger or these smaller banners here, I'm I don't envision that there would be dozens of these, but there would be smaller ones that could um, maybe discuss a little bit about the history. They would not be something that you recycle out, so they wouldn't have a glass door on it that you close and then open and have to put a poster in or something like that, but really they would provide some information about, uh, about the city, provide some history, provide some little tidbits and facts about this, this beautiful downtown and, and and how it became. The larger ones, um, basically, where are you? And you see, here I am. Once again, these are not really envisioned to be something that would be swapped out. They can be. Um, we will work through that as we move towards the 90%. But uh, we have found that with many clients and many municipalities and cities that they don't want to swap things out. And it's because who does it? And when does it happen? And then do we end up with a poster in there from uh, 2011 that doesn't get swapped out until 2025? And so that's one of the things that is taken into consideration. Is there an opportunity there to uh, have an electronic feature within that? that because that's easily updatable. Uh, Third Friday events, downtown, anything going on downtown could be updated from here. That's a great idea, and that is something that can be done. So that we are basically using a electronic tools in which to tell our story, and, right. and you don't have to worry about the poster. The right, and you can cycle in history tidbits about particular buildings that are nearby each one of these. That's, that's a great idea. If, if we were to do that on the, the three-sided uh, piece, the kiosk, yeah, I, I would think that it might be advantageous to, to go analog on the two-sided or one-sided <clears throat> piece. Um, you know, I think an overabundance of the digital signage could be could end up actually detracting from the character of downtown. But um, but to do it on the larger element, you know, I think makes a lot of sense, especially given what Ms. Mitchell was saying about having to update it frequently. But the the smaller piece, um, you know, I would I'd hope we could just go with a standard map. Um, a you are here sort of mall map, for lack of a better term. Right. Yes. Even a, um, I know Newtown is doing plaques on their homes, some of them, that have kind of when they were built, a little bit mm -hmm. of information about who built them and, and something, something like that. Um, I don't know if we could talk with some of the people downtown and see if they want to have that buy-in and they would actually purchase the plaque and put it on their buildings, but it would be keeping a constant theme so that people could do that walking tour, the historic tour, and get that information, even if there's nobody around to talk to. Mm -hmm. That's a constant tour guide. Sure. It's a great idea. <clears throat> so as part of the downtown streetscape, we will have regulatory signs. And the goal is to make sure that we have sufficient without creating sign pollution. 
We will strive to use as many upright uh, materials as we already have. For example, we can put regulatory signs on the street lights in some circumstances so that we really minimize those total number of posts that both have to be maintained and that also really can clutter a streetscape. And then we have a couple of other options where we can have pedestrian wayfinding that may point to different uh, areas of, of the streetscape and say, if you, you know, two blocks this direction, you'll encounter whatever. So that's an opportunity. And then the last item that you see here would be an opportunity to create that gateway sign into this is downtown Salisbury. And so that really would focus on potentially um, on Division Street and at the beginning and the end of the project. So those, that is the site furnishing. I'll leave that up. Are there questions? Would you like me to leave the map up? Uh, let's start with the map. I, I have quite a few, but I'm going to defer to my council colleagues first. Um, if you have any comments, and then I'm going to give uh, the, the public an opportunity to comment. Uh, I might pepper my comments or questions in there, um, but um, let's start with council. Questions, comments? Uh, just one sure. comment. Um, the digital uh, information things are, are great, but the way things are going, and I know of one case where um, it was on a Wi-Fi system and it was hacked. Mm -hmm. Security, you know, we got to always think about it, especially going forward because the strangest things are happening now, and, and that's one of the considerations that we don't have somebody hacking into our information. Very true. Where was the three-sided one proposed for? It really makes sense that the three-sided one resides somewhere in the center of the project. I think that it's something that could actually be hardlined, which would um, minimize some of that hacking. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. If it's right outside here, that should be really easy to, to do. It's a good point. And we have a number of those kiosk elements already right. uh, in locations like that. I mean, <clears throat> they will go away, of course, but it would make sense to have one in front of the government office building. Yeah, and digital. people are accustomed to looking at those. I think they're pretty good about getting them switched out from the mayor's office, and people look there to see what's going on. I see people reading frequently. Okay. I won't make a comment on the digital stuff. I'm old-fashioned. I like, I like paper. <laughs> Understandable. Yeah. And, you know, we're becoming a retirement community. Remember that? We're a retirement community. And some older people... They love, you know, the newspapers becoming digital. And but we like to have the paper in our hand to see and read um, you keep looking information. At <laughs> yeah. Right. And I'm just saying we have to consider the people this old fashioned like me. Um, I like and I worry about the hacking too, but you know how I feel about Stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, you both make that joke, but the two of you have tablets sitting in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's really all we're talking about is a screen that they well, can see, update. Well, see, I'm trying to from save from here. Look, I'm thinking about the taxpayers of paper. <laughs> paper costs I'm more than, than... I'm being selfish. <laughs> reprinting the paper all the time would, would cost more than just updating this. Well, I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, some older people. And, and you'd be surprised some younger people don't like computers. What would it be like watching TV? Yeah. Well, I, and I agree that digital signage in general... Probably something we want to minimize. Uh, and we want to have as few of those as possible. Uh, but I, I do understand Ms. Mitchell's point about updating that information and how easily it gets out, out of date. Um, I agree with the digital, but it's just, you know, I'm just throwing my two cents. Just absolutely. one spot. Give me one spot. <laughs> All right. Ms. Mitchell, do you have anything? No, I think I asked as I went along. Okay. All right, well, I'll make a few comments now, and then I'll, um, I'd will like to give the public an opportunity to come up and ask questions and comment. Um, first of all, I, I love where we're going. I love the continued development. This is, um, you know, we have 
continue to address all of the questions and concerns that have come up over time. I know I peppered you guys with a lot of those last time. I apologize for that, but I appreciate the hard work that you've put in. Um, there are a few lingering, of course, and we're going to um, talk about those tonight, I'm sure. Um, I want to talk to you real quick about the, if we can go to the intersection of Maine and Division. Um, it's up there now. The, um, I'm wondering about, I'm looking at the arrangement of the, uh, of the crosswalks, and I'm just wondering if, uh, if in that space, um, I, I can imagine that a speed table wouldn't be appropriate there, uh, given that you would probably want traffic to flow at a slightly higher speed through there than you would back at St. Peter's or even at Market Street. But I'm wondering if there isn't something with patterning between those uh, crosswalks that could be done that could reflect the same sort of importance of that intersection as you do in the other intersections. Paul, you look like you wanted to say something. I was going to say, perhaps we just continue the brick papers and, and fill them throughout that whole area. Yes, we can. We will look at that as an opportunity. I think that there are a number of opportunities here that could evoke back to a similar pattern here. Um, there's also opportunities, if you would like us to, to go a little bit broader, and we can become even more elaborate with even logos and things like that, if that is something that is desired. Okay, something we can talk about, I'm sure. Um, also, I'm going to do this before I before I continue. Just a uh, comment to anyone who wants to make a comment. I don't have any requests for comment yet, but the forms are over on this table, and you can just fill out a little form, um, and that way I'll know you want to come up and make a comment uh, later. Um, let's see. Um, I also see that the alignment, and I know we talked about this at one point, but the alignment of the um, westbound, uh, the northerly lane on um, Main Street as it approaches the intersection with Division is aligned with the sidewalk, so to, as to indicate, you know, do not enter. You cannot go straight. Um, can, can we utilize, and I know we talked about this, but we haven't, you know, I didn't hear tonight exactly how it will be executed. The alignment is part of that. The, the other question, I guess, that I have is um, can we use no, you know, right turn only or something like that to also indicate rather than, again, trying to avoid the idea of do not enter, do not enter. Well, no, um, we don't have the sign and striping plan here, but there will be the arrows on the road okay. that, that designate you're in a right turn lane, you're in a left turn lane. Okay. So you'll, you'll see that. Whereas, uh, you know, there's no straight arrow also. Okay. There's some, there'll be some small do not enter on the small. signal posts. Okay. Not big, large ones. And we okay. are envisioning the first month or so to put some kind of BMS sign up okay. that people are used to not, people are used to being able to go straight there. Right. So you might have some temporary, large scale, bright, variable message sign that says, you know, do not sure. enter eastbound only. New traffic um, pattern. Right, right. But wait, 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 wait. You can't go straight there? You will not be going straight. No, it's, so if I'm, as if I'm presented car, last time, if I'm the a car direction of travel is driving different. this direction right uh -huh. here, my opportunity is to take a right or to take a left. And then this traffic will be one way going towards Division Street, and then you go straight. Okay, so we are doing one way. All the drawings I saw had two way traffic on it, and I. I wasn't here at the last meeting, division? so. I've never no, seen any drawings. No, it's on West Main Street. We'll only traffic. be going east into town. So, so you, you come, come from the from west side and come into division. downtown. Okay. okay. From right. the west side so across the... Okay. Yes. So have we okay. discussed um, on the other side of the gateway building making that road go the... Well, no, it already goes that direction, so they would be opposite now. Right. Because right. right now they go the same direction. Everything goes the same. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. Cam Camden Street and... Camden, yes. And... Main Street now go the same direction. Right. This would, this would kind of create a loop. Very good. Yes, yes that's would. correct. Um, so you can drive around the block. Okay. Basically. Yeah. And, and, and you can come in from the west side. And we should have mentioned uh, parking while we're talking about going around the block. Uh, the The entire project has right now, I think, 65 parking spaces, and it's being increased to 90. So there's significantly more parking, and yes, most of that is on West Main Street. Okay. So as you're coming into town, you have those opportunities to park on West Main Street that you really have very limited opportunities yeah. to do so now. Are we accomplishing that by diagonal parking, or, parking or, or shortening the spaces? It's uh, it's all parallel parking. We still just have the one direction of travel, but now we have uh, the 
actual straight parking spaces. Oh, you're talking about them? Uh, the yes, park. on, on okay. the old plaza. Yeah, well, West that's Street. easy to yeah. see where they come from. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's a more parking on the old West. The old plaza section, yep, West Main Street. Okay, good. Significant. And that was a result of the interviews with all the property owners. Yes, correct? absolutely. Right. That's, that's good. That's good. Um, it's a lot better than the, what, five we have now? Right. Well, four <laughs> or five, yeah. right. Um, one of the questions that I had or comments I wanted to make was in regard to the trees. Um, looking at a couple other towns and cities that have done uh, downtown uh, infrastructure streetscape projects like this, um, like Georgetown, Delaware, um, one of the things that I've seen is their, their trees um, have typically been very, very young trees. Uh, and you know, even two years later, they haven't really filled out yet. Um, I'm wondering if there's a, an eight, I don't know if that's a mature, not an arborist, but I wonder if there's a, a maturity uh, that can be done. And I know that you all have started to look at the, the species mm -hmm. of tree, um, but I, I don't know if it's selection or if it's maturity. Um, I don't know if you have a comment on that. I do have a comment on that. And ultimately it boils down to a couple of things. On this project, we're putting permeable pavement, and then underneath the permeable pavement, we're putting structural, I'll use structural soils just because it's the easiest way to understand it. Basically, wherever you see blue and partially into the gray sidewalk area is going to be a void with soil in it that the tree can actually grow. And the biggest problem with street trees right now is we cut out a little 4x4 four four hole or a 6x4 hole and then we say, street tree, I gave you this little space and I gave you a pretty cruddy soil and I expect you to grow happy and be big and be marvelous. And filter all over. Yes. <laughs> and ultimately the, the end point there is a dead tree and the standard street tree right now if you just do that, is living about five to seven years. Mm. So by putting in the structural soils underneath, we both support the sidewalk up above it, but we are we're providing the opportunity for the tree roots to be able to have a space to grow. So what you have underneath your sidewalk is actually topsoil, for lack of a better word. And that is one of the things that is supporting our street trees in this circumstance. Now, the size of the street tree is a different story. Um, the larger the street tree that we put in, a little bit harder that it gets to be able to put into the pit itself. But we can put in some larger trees. The, um, the, the statistics show that a tree that it was put in that was larger and a tree that was put in smaller, within five years, the smaller tree usually has bypassed the larger tree. And this is because the larger tree, under good growing conditions, <coughs> kind of gets shocked. Basically, somebody came by and they use a gigantic shovel, for lack of a better word. It's a tree spade. And they go and they dig it. And it's severing its roots. And it's taking out of the environment that it was accustomed to growing in. And it's dumping it in a new environment. And it kind of says, whoa. And so usually it kind of it doesn't grow much for the next two years. And then after that, it'll start to grow. Well, in that time period, the younger tree didn't have that shock. It's like, oh, yeah, whatever you do to me. It's like a little kid, you know. You throw this at them, you throw that at them. They, they're pretty resilient. Um, and so in that respect, usually the, the smaller tree has bypassed it. However, I will say that if we put too small a tree in these tree pits, that the pedestrian traffic will just blow it over. So usually is what we're focusing for is a two to two and a half inch caliper tree, which has a trunk about this big, maybe a tad bit bigger. Okay. All right. I, I mean, that address, I think, so I, I think if I understand your, your answer, I may see the same thing that I've seen in other communities that I didn't necessarily like, but in the long term, it's probably a, a better uh, plan, and it's probably better to insert the, the younger tree yes, because you're not shocking the system and causing it to uh, grow more slowly. Understood. Can I okay. put in there for a yeah, second? Please. The soil underneath the sidewalk, is there a structure or just having that soil there that allows, uh, prevents uh, the roots uprooting the sidewalk or disturbing the sidewalk? 
yes, minimizes there, maybe. Yes, there is. And actually, um, the <clears throat> now I wish I had the section in front of me, and I apologize, but I don't. But is what we look at is we have concrete or pavers on top. Then underneath that, we have six inches of clean wash stone. The clean wash stone is double cleaned so that there's no fines in it. Trees, what trees are looking for is that they are looking for soil, for nutrients. They're looking for water and they're looking for air. Tree roots need to breathe or they'll die. So is what we do is we put that stone layer between the pavement and the soil below to minimize, <coughs> it basically is this void that is like, there's no reason for me to be there. There's no nutrients, and there is, uh, there's no soil in it because we have no little fines in it. It's basically gravel, like pea gravel almost, is, is the word that I'll use in this circumstance. And then, because it's pea gravel, the air is getting down to the soil below. So the tree roots will grow in that top, nice topsoil below it, but they don't want to get up into the gravel. And so that's the solution that uh, the arborists are using now in streetscapes to help ensure that we don't have heaving uh, sidewalks because we don't want to do that. Right. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Um, the, uh, if we can pan to the right um, and go down East Main Street just a little bit, um, looking at the crosswalk dimensions both there and at all the way to Division Street, um, they seem narrower than the Main Street crosswalk dimensions. Can you, can you tell me how wide those are? Kathy, I think that I think they'll be the same. They'll be ten feet wide. They're ten feet wide. Okay. Yes. All right. That probably includes the, the concrete band that's around them. Okay, that's actually wider than I thought it would be. That's that's good. Um, uh, if we can pan up North Division Street just a bit. There we go. Um, at the uh, uh, northern end of. North Division Street by Church Street and US 50. Um, one of the change orders, as you recall, that we discussed was to, or that we approved, was to uh, extend the planning process um, and the planning area all the way up to uh, the intersection with Church Street, and that that would include a planted area or a bioretention area on the western side there um, from the last parking space or around there. Um, up to the intersection with Church Street. Uh, is that included in the plan now, or will it be? It, so it, it will be into the 90%. Is What happened is that by the time the change order came across our table, um, there wasn't time to get that into this drawing set. So okay. it, it is on the drawing table. OK, great. That, in, that included the changes to the lanes going out onto 50, correct? That's correct. The road dining. Yeah, the road dining. Excellent. Um, the uh, pan down just a little bit, please. Excellent. The um, the changes you were discussing to the bioretention area on the east side of this street um, at the uh, government office building plaza, um, kind of pulling that up to the north or removing that bioretention area. Um, one of the thoughts and uh, that I had, and I don't want to say concerns, but one of the thoughts I had was that the uh, the trees. Um, Really, the, the tree kind of immediately in the center, uh, right at the, the street tree, yeah, that one and the one to the south of it, uh, that one? Yes. Um, those two trees, I, I think, might present a problem in terms of line of sight if the stage is going to be, if the government office building steps are to be used as a stage, um, and uh, which it is now. Um, and if you're to try to incorporate the street, which we have been lately, into any uh, any events or festivities, community events, um, those could present a line of sight problem, I would think. Uh, would it be possible to remove the one tree, um, the southern tree where the cursor is right now, uh, and maybe pull back the, the northern two trees so you could better see what was going on on the stage? Yeah. Yes. The answer to that is yes, we, we will take that into consideration. So if you're having a community event and you're standing in the street, you know, and, and you've got the dancers up on the stage, you know, or whatever you've got going on, if, if there's trees in the way, my thought is, yeah, that you wouldn't be able to see, or you'd have a tree right in your way. How old are the trees? How old are those trees? Well, that tree doesn't exist. That, that's a proposed tree. Oh, oh, okay. Those are proposed okay. trees, so I'm just Not suggestingly. Right. I'm suggesting gotcha. 
reconsider that. Um, an another thing um, that I, I wanted to bring up with respect to that and really this entire portion of the project, as we've talked about before, um, you know, this requires a, um, you know, although it's a city project, this is county property. I mean, this is something we certainly have to, and I'm not just saying this because our county executive is in the room. Um, <laughs> this is going to require a partnership with, uh, with the county. Uh, and, and working with them to ensure that um, you know it doesn't uh, disrupt you know as we do it uh, as we as we do the work the construction um, it, we also want to make sure that it uh, it kind of fits with their vision of the overall property um, and and although I don't think it's uh, you know a terrible disruption and similar kind of layout and especially the um, the southern portion of this the beautification of the property uh, in front of the um, uh, the old courthouse, I think, would tie in nicely with um, the uh, county executive's plans for cleaning up the uh, or repairing the old courthouse. Uh, I think it's important that we know that the county's on board and know that you know this is a joint effort. And, um, you know, it may be again a city-funded project, but we want to make sure that uh, our county partners agree that uh, this is the right thing to do in the right place. Um, ha have those conversations started? No. Okay. That's, that's going to be an important thing to do, probably before we have 90% drawings, I would think. And I, I'm seeing from the audience that, uh, uh, that before we have 90% drawings, it would probably be a good idea to have that agreement in place. Um, conversation was just started. Okay. <laughs> conversation just started right here. That's right. Um, the... Uh, I, th I think this addresses most of my questions. Um, I, I had several other questions about uh, utilities and um, the uh, potential for fiber through the area, fiber down the street, but I'll reserve those for now. Um, I want to get to uh, bike lanes and bike infrastructure. Um, can you quickly address uh, the design that we're looking at on the screen? and what is proposed in terms of both bike lanes and bike infrastructure. And then I'm going to in invite Mr. Drew to come forward to the podium to, uh, to ask his question. Yeah, I'll turn the time Steve. over to Kathy. Kathy. Yeah. Um, so obviously we have two different sections of roadway here because the width of the West Main Street is different than the width of East Main Street. So on West Main Street, we do have a 15-foot lane. There's parking on both sides of the road. So within that 15 feet, we will have a striped 10-foot travel lane and a 5-foot striped bike lane. Okay. Is the bike lane to the north or to the south? Well, it can go either way. Um, we've been instructed that if you prefer to be on the south, and that doesn't affect us because there's still parking on both sides, so either way you'll have the okay. same issues. Okay. Okay. So then if you pan over to East Main Street, um, we have eight foot parking on both sides, eight foot width parking bays on both sides. And so that leaves us with uh, two 12 foot lanes, one in each direction. And those will be, um, they will be marked with sharrows, which are shared use lanes, meaning that those 12 foot width lanes will be used for bikes as well as cars. Okay. And actually the sharrows will also be striped on Division Street. Okay. All right. Uh, with that, thank you. That's it. Mr. Drew, sure. would you like to come forward? First, uh, hi, uh, Matt Drew with the um, Bike Pedestrian Advisory Committee. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, staff and all the great um, work that we've had. We've had a, our, our committee has had a presentation of these design plans, and there's been a lot of great conversation, and I very much appreciate um, your willingness to be um, open to, to lots of different thoughts on this. Uh, I'm only going to speak to the bike lanes. Um, I, I think it's incumbent on us to um, provide dedicated bike lanes on this section of East Main Street that we're, we're talking about for a number of reasons. Um, it's, it's statistically proven that um, having dedicated bike lanes versus uh, shared arrows increases uh, the passing distances when vehicles pass cyclists. So it makes it uh, much safer for the cyclists, increases uh, the level of comfort that, that cyclists experience. Uh, so therefore, people are more likely to, to ride a bike. Um, it provides very defined space for cyclists and vehicles. So everybody knows where they're supposed to be at any given time. Um, 
The 10 foot lane width, I, I, I'm glad to hear that we have that on West Main Street. I'd like to see that also added to East Main Street as well because that's gonna promote lower vehicle speeds. Um, and uh, I think a five foot lane um, also helps, uh, particularly in, in this area where we've got dedicated on-street parking, a uh, five foot lane uh, provides ample space for a, a cyclist to pass a parked car and still stay outside of the swing zone of a door as a, as a person gets out of their car. Um, I think uh, sharrows are a great first step when you're simply retrofitting an existing space and you don't have the opportunity to reconfigure that space, but that's not the case here. We're, we're completely redoing um, this section of East Main Street, so I think it would be, it would be, we would be remiss as a community if we let this opportunity pass by without adding dedicated bike lanes. So thank you for the thank opportunity. You, thank you. Um, so, so given uh, that perspective, and I'm sure, I, I know in fact that you've heard that perspective in the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee meetings um, and with uh, discussions um, with the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee and Traffic Safety Advisory Committee, I believe. Um, can you give us some sense of what it would take, can you give City Council some sense of what it would take um, to, uh, to modify the plans as they exist to incorporate um, uh, dedicated bike lanes on the eastern portion of Main Street? Okay, uh, thank you for your uh, presentation, Matt. And uh, yes, we have uh, uh, been talking about dedicated bike lanes for a while on this project. And essentially we have uh, three uh, key aspects if they were to be implemented. Uh, these have been uh, thought through already uh, by the uh, Salisbury Public Works Director and Upper Management. And uh, we, uh, given all the considerations, we did decide against them. Um, however, uh, this is the reconsideration at this point. Um, the biggest issue, I would say number one, is acquiring approximately 20 easements. Uh, from different property owners along the south side of East Main Street. Um, perhaps these businesses would be open to allowing us to acquire those easements. Uh, perhaps it would increase uh, traffic to them. Perhaps it would increase uh, you know, profits in some way. Um, so they, they may be open to that suggestion. Um, if in fact they are, we would need to somehow uh, gauge them, engage that communication to them in which I would suggest a meeting at the Chamber of Commerce or, or something like that uh, to see if they were open to us acquiring that their uh, existing four feet of property. Um, right now they just have uh, like concrete planters there, um, which, which could be removed. Um, however, in some areas such as the uh, Salisbury Area Chamber of Commerce, uh, there is uh, uh, grass and, and, and pavers there that would have to be uh, removed at this point. Um, but again, perhaps they would be open to uh, to uh, consideration of, of doing that. Paul, Go some, ahead, some of those, I, I know that there are some sort of low concrete planters. There are some things, I mean, and I imagine if they were kind of removed, there would be a, uh, an that, issue potentially with what was exposed. You know, it would be like tearing a piece of the foundation off just from an attractiveness standpoint, or would require the, some repair. The would brick think. would probably have to be repointed. <clears throat> okay. I, but I, I don't I foresee that being huge. a huge uh, technical issue. Um, and, and then, okay, you've got an image of it. Um, and then there are some, there are these two buildings where there's actually structure. I mean, there's a, you know, steps and there's the Design Atlantic office uh, that has the little vestibule that pokes out. What would you, I mean, how would we get around that? I mean, you can't tear those off. Good question, and we've already uh, thought through how that would happen. Okay. I believe that Steve can actually pull up a, a, a PDF of, of how we would go around that. Um, it presents some sort of a technical issue, but, but not enough that we, we couldn't get around that. And, and while we're um, pulling that up, I'll just explain from that picture where you saw those steps come out. Uh, the front of the steps is essentially <coughs> the right-of-way line. So the right-of-way line is about four feet off of the businesses on East Main Street, right in that um, first block from Division Street. So where you see, um, you, you can almost see a, a seam in the sidewalk right now, all their, their planters, their steps and whatnot are on their property. So even though we'll be replacing the sidewalk up to them, their bump outs right now would remain. What they have right on their property would remain obviously those steps. So to keep those, those steps um, in place, which they would have to be, uh, 
we've created this exhibit, which I'll turn back over to Paul. I just want to explain that that's yeah. where the four feet comes from. Is is there's pretty much from the face of buildings out four feet is the actual right of way line. And to better illustrate it, this is all private property right now, from the edge of these concrete planters mm -hmm. to the face of the building. That's approximately four feet. And these are the steps that we just showed a picture of, uh, the brick steps that would not be removed. Um, we would just uh, curve the sidewalk around them. So, Paul, we would have to negotiate the uh, acquisition of the easement to the every other property to the left of there, to the west of there. So. Correct. Okay. And every other property to the east, to the and east everything as well. to the east. Now, so so this brings up a question for me, which is, um, on the north side of the street, we don't have quite so many property owners. The right of way line is right on the face of buildings in a lot of cases on the north side. So especially once you're down to the east of say Baptist Street, the right of way is. Well, let's start from Baptist okay. West first. Um, from that point west, you've got a federal building and you've got grass. Um, that's on, uh, I believe, county property. Um, so, I mean, four feet out of grass, I would think, would be easier to negotiate. Again, working with your county partners, working with the federal government who owns that three-story masonry building, um, I would think that that would be a far easier uh, negotiation process than everything on the south side. Um, and I realize then you'd ha hit an alignment issue and you know have to jog a little bit at the intersection, but I would think you know eight property owners, two property owners. Um, I would think that the north side would be easier to negotiate. And on the north side, I, I don't believe that we will need to acquire easements because okay. the property line goes up to the face of. Uh, the property line is at the face of the building there. Well, I know it is on once we get past Baptist. I don't have that on this drawing, Paul, if you know where that is. Maybe Kathy has it. I'm not positive we would have to negotiate that on the north side. Okay. We need to verify but, that. Yeah, we would need to verify that. Would the argument for not doing that simply be the, the slight adjustment that would be required in terms of alignment? I think there's also the retaining walls there. Uh, if you picture down by Division Street, you know, you're, you're going up steps when you're walking up on the courthouse property. So there's a significant elevation difference right, right there. If we're cutting back four more feet, we're cutting into a slope. What's behind that other than soil? Probably we don't know. Soil, right. Probably just soil? I don't know. I mean, again, you know, the person, we need to talk to our Friends at the county, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that the government at the steps on the on the side, um, I guess that's the courthouse or the next building. Oh no, just past Court Street. I guess I'm looking. I'm, Those I, steps go all the way to the right away line. Yeah. Okay, I, I'm just thinking about the potential cost in terms of acquiring easements, the potential cost in terms of delaying the project further, um, and the ease of negotiating to the north. If it's possible to, if it's possible to make this work, um, you know, I, I think it would be worth you know, setting ourselves a deadline and saying, you know, within the next X weeks, we're going to try to figure out whether or not, you know, that's an agreement we could come to with the property owners, um, and if not, we're going to proceed with without. I mean, I feel like that would be a reasonable way to approach this, um, but you know, that's just me. I defer to my council, fellow council members to offer your perspectives on this, but I would think that that would be a better approach. I realize once we get past Baptist to the east, we're then going to have to have, um, you know, a negotiation with, I think, one, two, three or four property owners, maybe more, um, on the south side. One, two, three. One, two, three. There's four here. Okay. That's one property owner. parking lot. And then five, six, seven, eight, nine. Those are um, different entrances, but that's one property owner. It's one, okay, yep. that's right. That's one property owner. So this is one property owner. Yeah. Mr. Renee. Um, okay, uh, so uh, I don't know. I want to hear from fellow council members. And uh, bear in mind, we're running short on time. If we need to continue this discussion at Thursday's work session, we can do that. Um, but Jack, Laura, Cheney. Okay, thank you. Um, whichever one we can work out, I, th I think obviously fewer that we it's 
that we have to discuss with and, and work with. It seems like it would be easier, but that depends on who it is you're dealing with. Okay. It could end up being easier going with multiples than, than any particular two. Yeah. We should keep it all over. Mr. Council President, my, my only concern is is that at 65% in and headed toward 90, how, how much might we be adding in terms of cost and how long are we going to delay the project? If, That's if what we, I'd want to figure out. I mean, what, what are we willing, I mean, what, could we devote a week to, could we devote two weeks to discovery? I mean, the work hasn't been done to figure out whether or not this is an easy thing or a, a difficult thing in terms of the, the easement. So. I mean, even if it were days of work and not weeks or months. Right now, we're looking at an estimated uh, $50,000 change order <clears throat> to perform the redesign services. Okay. Um, we would essentially need to organize a, a shotgun meeting at the Chamber of Commerce and see if these business owners are, in fact, willing to uh, give away their uh, that, that four foot of, of property. And it would have to be uh, unanimous. Well, again, or discuss. I understand that it yes. would have to be unanimous, uh, and, and or discuss the the northern option as well. Jack, do you have any? The only the only that aside, which should be done. Uh, the only thing I want, could you just for my benefit, you know, my hot button, could, for my benefit, what would be the final configuration in terms of width <coughs> versus the recommend recommendations you initially had? regarding us to travel lanes and bike lanes. So, so if we go ahead with this um, proposal, right. then the East Main Street will have a 10-foot lane in each direction and a full 5-foot bike lane in each direction, and the parking lanes will be 7-foot wide instead of the 8 feet. And then from behind the curve, um, you will have the same dimensions that we have now. It's just that we have to gain the 4 feet from the property owner. Okay. And, and the only place that that would change is where these steps bump <clears throat> out here, that the sidewalk would be pinched down to three and a half or four feet. So it would take out the trees in those areas so that you can walk where the um, porous pavers are. So where we have bump outs that have to remain, we would leave those and then we would have no trees because three and a half feet isn't wide enough for a sidewalk. So we would gain that four and a half feet where the, the landscape would be planted in other places. Okay. I, just for clarity, I think I remember a meeting maybe two meetings ago, we talked about, and I don't want to misuse the term standard because I know that there's different standards, but there was a recommendation apparently that we started, we had 11 foot travel lanes for the cars, no? Well, we've had a couple different options um, presented and they each have benefits and uh, disadvantages. Right. So with the ten 12 feet, feet, yeah. Yeah, 10 feet is narrow. We typically don't go that narrow. And uh, Jennifer Miller has expressed interest in not having seven foot wide parking lanes. She would prefer at least eight feet wide. So to do this, the 10 foot lane, five foot bike, and seven foot parking, we're, we're skinning down You're every standard every, we have. Okay. Okay. All right. Every Thank standard you. would be minimum requirement. What I'd like to do, I think what we need to do is um, at the very latest, um, and if possible, discuss on at Thursday's council meeting. Um, Thursday morning we have a scheduled, regularly scheduled council meeting. Right, no, 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 please, yeah, we understand that you can't be at that, but we thank you for everything that you two have provided and that your firm sure. has provided. Um, but uh, I don't think we're going to be able to, you know, make any recommendations tonight. Um, so that said, uh, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you. We are two minutes into our scheduled time for our legislative session. Steve, Kathy, thank you so much. Paul, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so Dave. much for your hard work on this. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Thanks thank a you. lot. Thank you. All right. And with that, our work session is adjourned. And we're going to go ahead and go right into Do you need a minute? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we're going to take a two-minute break. Yeah. And we will reconvene for our legislative session. <laughs>